When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the moon wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, and so you better be believing. Our God is an awesome God. Good morning and welcome to St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Dade City and we thank you for being with us this morning. Our service begins in your bulletin or on page 355 if you're using the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
the Lord be with you. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. <clears throat> then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Today's appointed psalm is Psalm 146. Let us say this together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of earth, for there is no help in him. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have had the God of Jacob for their help whose hope is in the Lord their God, and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed, and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous, the Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. The Lord shall reign forever. A reading from the letter of James. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the law, whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. 
For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon was gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon, toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private away from the crowd and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Aphapatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. 
I speak to you this morning in the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. I speak to you this morning in the name of our triune God. I have to share with you that one of the activities that I loved most as a little boy was coloring. It was something that I really loved doing, whether it was in a coloring book, just on paper by itself, or sometimes even the walls of the house, much to my mother's uh, disregard. But I loved to color because it was just it was so fun to let your imagination run wild and put whatever color you wanted to in the pictures. And I tell you, when you finally got to where you get that Crayola 64 box of crayons, you know, the one with all the crayons and the sharpener in the middle, boy, you knew you would hit the big time. I had every color there is known to man. But that's important for us just as a metaphor to use for this. Because with those crayons, it didn't matter if they were old or new. It didn't matter if they had a sharp point on them or had been rubbed down to a nub. It didn't even matter if they were broken in half. They still had a place in the box. And they still had a purpose. And they still had the opportunity to create something beautiful. Our church should be that way. The world should be that way. That we come to recognize that everybody has a purpose, regardless of who they are, regardless of their height, their sex, their politics, whatever. We all have gifts and skills that God has given us. We can all be used to His glory to make beautiful things happen, to bring beauty into the world. But we can only do that if we really enjoy and take in the whole array that God has given us. We can't just stick to blue. And that's the only crayon we use. Because that's called partiality. That's called being partial to that one color. And that's the theme in our lessons if you listen to them today. James is talking about that. In horror of horrors we ever see Jesus being embroiled in partiality. Jesus is partial against the woman whose daughter he's going to heal. He judges her as a Gentile woman. It says, no way does she have enough faith to understand what I'm doing here. But boy, is he proved wrong. When she comes back and says, after he says, we don't feed the dogs, you know, the people's food, but she says, ah, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. Even the crumbs of your faith is enough for us. And Jesus lights up. She gets it. She understands faith. And he's misjudged her. And he changes his whole opinion of her in that and heals her daughter. It was really the beginning of the Gentile mission. This little uh, part of the gospel because it's the first time that Jesus is really completely healed without touching somebody who is a Gentile. He has opened his mission. But partiality is something that's really hard for us to deal with on a day-by-day -day basis. We all kind of have our own partialities and our own prejudices from where we were raised, how we were born, what we've gone through in life. We kind of call it survival instinct. You know, something that makes us sharp and look at things. But the problem is when we do that, when we use those instincts to separate people, we really limit ourselves. And we reject the ability to see God's creation as He really intends it to be before us. And it really limits our choices as well. It limits our opportunities in life. When we take some people and tell them to sit down here at my feet and show others the finest chair in the pew. That's being judgmental. That's judging, which we're told most specifically not to do. And this word partiality has changed quite a bit over time. In the Old Testament, it kind of just meant having favoritism towards somebody. You know, I prefer you other than you. But then it came to mean having favoritism because 
of somebody's wealth or power or position. In other words, we care more about them because what they can do for us than we care more about this guy who can't do anything. But then even later on in the New Testament, as Paul was writing and as James was writing, it took on a whole other flavor. And partiality meant not just that we curry favor with somebody else, but that those people have an undue influence over us. They chose to change our perspective of things, that we don't operate the way that we're supposed to. And so we have to be very careful about being partial with people. We have to be careful that we're not pulled into worldly things and in doing so reject heavenly things. And that's what we're being warned here. And by the way, that partiality goes both directions. They're using the rich in this thing, and we should not be partial to the rich. They are no more a part of the kingdom of God than we are. But by the same token, we also shouldn't be partial to the poor and lift them up and put them on a pedestal because they've had less or they've suffered or whatever. The point is we shouldn't judge either way. We shouldn't be partial to anybody for any reason because we are all children of God. We are all alike in God's eyes and we're all part of his kingdom. So we need to quit putting people in boxes. We need to quit putting people in little columns of people that check this identity and that identity and this identity. Because that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to look at people. We're called to look into people. To look into their eyes, into their heart, into their soul. And see what they're really about. That's what it means to open ourselves to the kind of love that God calls us to. To love one another as he loved us. How do you think we would fare if God was partial toward us and started putting us in boxes about how much grace he'd give or whether he'd love us or not? I got a feeling there'd be a whole bunch of us over on one side, right, that do sinful things and don't do the law that he instructs us to do. So why should we have any more power than God by being partial against other people? God doesn't judge us unnecessarily, so why should we judge others? And that was a real danger that James in our reading today was worried about. He was worried about this conflict of partiality, and so he gives us this story. And we might have actually even experienced it in churches in our lifetime. Someone comes in with fine clothing and rings on their fingers and looks all official and everything, and so... Everyone kind of bows down and scrapes. Oh, please come here. Sit in the bigger chair. Sit in the, the closest place where you're closer to the music. We show partiality to that person because we think they're special for some reason. But then the beggar in a shorts and a t-shirt comes in our door and we say, sit back here so nobody will see you. You're welcome to come in, but, you know, try to be seen and not heard. We show that partiality. We have those kind of prejudices within us. And James knew it. James knew it because we all know who have studied the early church. The early church was racked with conflict between the rich and the poor, between the Gentile and the Jew. There were all kinds of different forces at play in the early church that actually at any moment could have torn the church apart. And one of them was this difference between affluence and poorness. And so James tells this story about the man coming in and the poor man being told to sit at my feet. And he tries to remind his church, he tries to remind his people that we have to be careful of that. We have to be careful especially of forgetting the other people because of our love for the rich man to be within the, the realm of power, the realm of position. You know, politicians love this, right? They love having people bow down to them. Oh, you're so special because you got elected by 49.5% of the people. You know? But we do it. It's a prejudice that we have in our life. We kind of, for some reason, want to be around that power instead of the power of God. But James tells us very succinctly here that we shouldn't be doing that. 
We shouldn't be judging other people, especially in a church. Because we are all God's creatures, we are all God's creation. And God sees us all the same, regardless of what individual body we happen to inhabit while we're here on earth. The only thing that can separate us from God, that separates us from each other, is our sinfulness. Is our ability to turn away from God's word and refuse to do what God tell us, tells us to do. That's what God's looking for. He's judging us justly. He's judging us by the things we do. Not by how much money we have or how we look or the kind of things that we do. That's how he calls us to judge, to judge justly, to look at people's works, to look how they actually show their love of Christ. But even then, it's not up to us to be the final judge. That job is God's and God's alone. He's the one that will come at the day of judgment and divide the ones that have followed him and the ones haven't. If we start worrying about what other people do, if we start worrying about other people's issues, then what does that say about us? We're not focusing on our love for Christ. We're being a judge and saying, ah, you're not as good as I am. You didn't do this. Or you're not as good as this person. You didn't do that. And that's not what we're called for. We're called to love one another, and we cannot possibly love one another if we're all the time judging each other. If we're all the time putting people on a scale of how much we're going to love them based on what we know about them, that makes loving one another very, very hard. If we're going to constantly judge those we're supposed to love and kind of do a spiritual triage on how important they are in our life. And so James really was concerned about this. He was concerned about this tearing the church apart. Now, you might be asking yourselves a question, though. Well, if we're not supposed to show any partiality, how come all through the Bible Jesus and the disciples seem to show a partiality toward the poor? Right? We hear in Beatitudes, blessed are the poor. We hear Jesus all the time saying, you know, blessed are the poor. But once again, they're not showing judgment in that. They're showing observation. Jesus has observed the poor. He knows what the poor are looking for. He knows what the poor need. Remember in John where he says, you will have the poor with you always. And in fact, Abraham Lincoln once said, God must have loved the common man so much, he made so many of them. Most of them are not, of us are not princes and kings. Most of us are not politicians. We're just people trying to earn a living and raise a family Most and do the best that we can do. But James tells us that the poor, though, feel a special message out of the gospel. Because they have nothing in Jesus' time. Most of the poor barely have enough money for the food to put on the table at night. But they hear these words from Jesus Christ. And they hear release and they hear redemption. They hear love and they hear grace. Most importantly, they hear hope. And hope is something that is missing from their lives at this time in history. As the Romans bear down on them. As the Jewish authorities bear down on them. As they're taxed into submission. These people have nowhere to turn. So when they hear this messenger talking about the love of God, the hope of eternal resurrection, that's what draws them to the gospel. Jesus isn't picking them over the rich. Remember the rich young man in Luke that came to Jesus for his ministry? Oh Lord, I've studied all the scripture, i followed all the laws. What do I have to do to follow you? Sell everything you have and follow me. Oh Lord, I've studied all the scripture. I followed all the And he turned and walked away. What do I have to do to follow you? The things we ask the rich to do, the well-off to do, are hard for them to do. 
because it means giving up worldly wealth and worldly comfort. The, we ask the, rich to do, the, the poor have none of that to give up. Hard for them to do. All they can do is reach out in hope. And that's why in most of the early churches of Paul, the poor were the driving forces in the churches. They were the people sitting in the pews because they wanted to hear that message of redemption and everlasting life, that message of hope, that message of love and grace. But James' worry was that if a rich person came in that congregation, they would all bow down to him thinking he was going to bring money to the church, that they would show partiality. But James reminds them in the next paragraph, uh, you guys, who is it that's taking all of your money? Who is it that's dragging you into court? Who is it that's putting such a burden on you that you have no hope? It's these wealthy people that you think are the cream of the crop. This group of people that love throwing their money and prestige around. But why don't they act justly with those around them? And that's what James is really getting at here. He's saying that we are called to act with justice toward everyone around them without partiality. We are to love everybody. We are to help everybody that we come to. That's the true message here. We can't show partiality in helping God's people because we are all God's people and there's no division there. We have to help everybody who is one of God's creation. And then James throws one little last zinger in there just for the people that are listening. He says, remember, if you break one law, one part of the law, you're a transgressor. You don't have to break 7 out of 10 or whatever. You know the law, but if you break even one, if you act unjustly even against one of the laws, you have broken God's word and you have acted unjustly. And he reminds them, what does God tell us? Judge not, lest ye be judged. So when we show favoritism, when we show partiality, when we show prejudice in the way that we deal with people, we are being unjust. We are not living according to God's law. And we need to remember, no matter how we feel, breaking the law and going against God stays with us. I was very pleased to be part of a Dinner for Eight group last night at Miss Margie's house. And one of the conversations that came up, we were talking about Kairos in prisons. And we were talking about, you know, what we call prisoners these days. We don't call them convicts, we call them inmates instead of convicts. But the truth is that once you've been convicted of a crime in this country, that stays with you forever. In many people's eyes, no matter if you paid your debt to society, completely changed your life around, you're still a convict. You're still someone who broke the law. And that's what people remember. And so when we break God's law, we too are convicted by that. We can ask for forgiveness if we dare. But we are convicted by what we do. And so we turn to the gospel, just like the poor do in this message. And we turn to the gospel because the message just draws us in. The message of the gospel gives value to those who have never felt value. The message of the gospel gives welcome to those who have never felt welcome. And the message of the gospel promises love for those who have never felt love. And sometimes that lack of love is caused by our partiality and by our prejudice. So we need to quit being prejudiced. We need to quit being partial. Because it does, it, it takes away our opportunities to get to know all of God's creation. It would be like 
using a crayon box that had all the same color crayon in it. Yeah, we might like midnight blue, but how would our pictures look if every single one of them was done in midnight blue? It'd be boring and stale. We only get the beauty of God's creation, the colors of God's creation, when we use all the crayons in our box. And that means everybody who's part of the kingdom of God. That's what we're being called to in today's message. To open ourselves to everybody. To open our hearts and open our minds to seeing people that we have never seen before. And seeing them in a new light. And if we do that, if we can drop our prejudices and put aside our, our partiality, we might just for a moment be able to see people in a new and glorious light. And more importantly, we might be able to see ourselves and others the way that God sees us. Please stand as we hear from our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found in your bulletin or on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our prayers this morning are Form 3, as is found in your bulletin. Let us kneel before God as we lift our voices to Him in prayer. Our prayers this morning are Form 3, as is found in your bulletin. Let us kneel before God as we lift our voices to Him in prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. <coughs> Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. Father, we pray for you. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Dabney, our bishop, Jim, our rector, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from every oppress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Give to the departed. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Gracious God, I lift up to you this day St. Mary's Episcopal Church and her people, that you might continue to give us your abundant grace and blessings, 
as we do your ministry in this place. I ask your blessing on all of those on our parish prayer list who are in need, those who are recovering from or preparing for surgeries, especially Melinda Bessinger, Lee Bren, Baby Lathan, Rosemary Pancake, Tisha, Phyllis Worth, Mike Smith. We pray for those with urgent need, Cecil McGavern, Dara Morgan, Wayne Highsmith, Nicholas Goody, Aubrey Henley, Gloria Gullen, Sarah Edwards, Larry Teston, Tammy Bentley, Ray, Peggy Fetch, Betty Carey, Jesse McGeehy, Darlene Lambert, Jason Hatcher, Joyce Delosier, Kelly Oakley, Cynthia V, Tim Abrams, Jeannie White, Julie and Leslie, the Reverend Richard Brent, and Al Heiler. We also pray for those with ongoing need this day, John, Casey, Jen, David, and family, Allison and family, Kay, Perry, Mark, Keith, Cecil, Melvin, Sue Ann, Barbara, Rondell, Elaine, and Vince. We pray for Jerry and Diane Rice, Dave and Marge Moffat, Terry and Denise McKenzie, Leon and Betty Milton, Jim and Janice Tabb, Karen and Dennis Phillips. We also pray this day for all of the members of our military, National Guard, and first responders, most especially those military who are stationed in and around Afghanistan and are very much in harm's way this day. Gracious God, we ask your guidance and protection on them. We also lift up to you all of the people still stranded in Afghanistan, that you would be with them and guide them as they try to find their way to safety and to freedom. Gracious God, we lift up to you all of our teachers, administrators, and staff in schools in this state and the nation and around the world. Gracious God, be with the teachers that are carrying the extra burden this year of new ways of learning and of the coronavirus in the midst of their students. Take away their fear and anxiety and frustration. Gracious God, be with all the children who have been inflicted by this in school. Let the healing power of your Holy Spirit be within them, that they may be brought to your wholeness. And gracious God, we ask you to be with all of those who are afflicted by diseases of any kind that you would be with them to guide, guard, and protect them and have your presence with them. Are there others? Using the confessional on page 360 of the Book of Common Prayer, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. And may Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace to the pastor, peace to the name, peace to the effort. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you.
please be seated. Uh, we have some announcements on the back of your bulletin, and I will direct your attention to those for your reading pleasure. But the two most important ones are, number one, we are continuing um, our progress with Cox Elementary to uh, get school supplies and clothing for those kids so that they can start their educational year out on the right foot. So um, if you have a heart to help, you can uh, do that in a number of ways. You can, if you go to Amazon or something, you can send it directly to Cox, and their address is in here. Or you can send it to Mike Menard, who is kind of heading this up, and he will make sure they get to Cox. You can send them here at the church, and we'll make sure they get the Cox. Or you can actually bring them in yourself, and we have some boxes in the parish hall that you can deposit them in. So there are a number of ways that you can get them there, but we need to get it done and get some help. So um, I ask you to please prayerfully think about helping those kids at Cox Elementary. Um, we're also in the process of uh, updating our directory for the church, and that means changes of addresses and changes of phone numbers and changes of emails. There is a form for that on the back of your bulletin. So if you have moved and changed any of those things, please let us know so that when this goes out, people will be able to get in touch with you. And you won't be sitting at home going, why didn't anybody call me on my birthday? Because the number you gave is like old or disconnected. So um, please do that so we can keep in touch, at least at the very least, your address, your um, phone number, and your email so that we have a multiple ways to contact you through the church. So, and if you don't want to use the form, you can send me or Sandra an email and just let us know what needs to be changed so that we can get working on that. Um, as always in our service, we celebrate birthdays. And celebrating birthdays uh, this week are Kathy Stokoe, Doug Dunkelberger, Liz Mitchell, Kathy Hobby, Amanda Price, and Carolyn Hodges. Who was that masked man? The lone pastor. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all of the days of our lives that you give us, and we thank you for being with us all of those days. Let us pray. Gracious God, I lift up to you all of those that are celebrating birthdays this week, most especially this, your servant Amanda. And I ask you to be with them on their special day. Let it be a day full of love and laughter and gr your abundant grace. And gracious God, just continue to be present with each of them. Continue to walk with them day by day. And let them feel your loving and holy presence. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And happy birthday. And we also have some anniversaries uh, this week. Uh, the Reverend... Uh, Deacon, uh, Robert and Gail Mellon, who I don't see here with us, Mike and Diane Smith, who are celebrating a birthday, and I'm going to embarrass our friends and bring another anniversary up. You two who just celebrated your anniversary, come on up. These are dear friends of ours from West Palm Beach, who surprised us with a visit this morning, so I'm going to repay that surprise by embarrassing them in front of everybody. One couple on each side, yeah. We don't go there. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you give us spouses, partners, those that we share our lives with, those that we can lean into in our time of need and can lean into us in theirs so that neither of us should fall. Gracious God, I ask you to bless all of those who are celebrating anniversaries this week, most especially these your servants, Mike and Diane and Bruce and Susan and I ask you to be with them on their special day. Let it be a day full of love and laughter and your abundant grace. And gracious God, just let them take a moment on that special day to focus inward, to find you at the focus of their marriage, at the center of their marriage. Continue to walk with them all of their days. And we ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And happy anniversary all. And I'm falling apart here.
So this is the time of the service that I say if this is your first time at St. Mary's, if you are here every now and again, or if you are here week by week. My brothers and sisters, welcome. You are home. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. I don't know if you can hear me. I truly think you're there. I believe that you do listen to us in this prayer. Yes, I know I'm just an outcast, but now I speak to you. Still I think and I remember You were once an outcast too The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. 
Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Here, 
This is the table not of the church but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come you who have faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. Sister Sharon, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Joseph, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Using the post-communion prayer in your bulletin or on page 366 of the Book of Common Prayer, 
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let him live in our hearts so that we may drop our prejudices and partialities and see each member of this world as a body of Christ and as a member of your church. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.